I contacted Nick Ebner as soon as I knew that I was moving to New York because I heard he was one of the fitness gurus of Manhattan. For Nick Ebner, fitness is a personal passion and lifelong journey. He spent five years studying under Polycon principles, and for the past few years, he's worked with Chris Summers, or known as Coach, Coach Chris Summers, the founder of Gymnastics Bodies. He's teamed up with Paul Watson to become the only Gymnastics Bodies affiliate in Manhattan and, in my opinion, are offering the best thing in town. Paul Watson is a founding partner and master trainer at Transform Fitness. He's got combined knowledge and studies in biochemical and biomechanical sciences with their application to the body through resistance training, physical therapy, massage, and occupational therapy. He believes that resistance training programs has a broad application if it includes the elements that define strength. Paul, together with Nick, are transforming the fitness industry. Just look at these guys. Check out your YouTube video version so that you can see these guys in action. So firstly, Paul and Nick, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So look, there's so many, so many questions for you, but I guess the first thing I wanted to find out was what's your personal experience with health and fitness? And then also how did you get into this personal training and what have you? So maybe we'll start with Nick. Okay. So um, I guess the best way to go about this would be to start with when I started because the journey kind of started with that and then moved into why. So I started when I was 18 with personal training and it was more just because I was a gym rat and I really liked being in the gym and I needed to make some money before I was going to college, uh, which continued through college. Um, I didn't see it as a viable source of income until I moved to Manhattan and realized that you can really do a lot with it, especially in New York City. And uh, I kept going with it from there. From the health side, uh, as many of us Many people have done college isn't necessarily the most healthy experience in our life. And coming out of it, I had a slew of health issues um, where I needed to learn how to fix myself. I didn't really like the conventional methods. And not that I'm against them, but I think they should be used in conjunction, not as an only. So uh, realizing early on as a, tra- as a young trainer that you, you really can't do one without the other if you really want true health. I had to learn the other side of it, which was health management. And that's kind of what brought us to where we are now. So just to to sort of recap then, you had some health issues. Do you mind sharing what those health issues were? Not at all. Uh, I've had insomnia probably since I was, well, from four or five years old till 26. Uh, I didn't realize I had it. I didn't really just until I really understood insomnia. And then it took me about two years to fix. Um, I had... uh, um, how many was the one? The other one was, oh, anxiety. It was really bad, especially in high school. That was diet related. Um, very Now, everyone's going to be a little different where different people react differently to different things. Food really affected me. And I had real bad anxiety in high school and college um, when I was writing papers or schoolwork where I just felt very overwhelmed, couldn't handle it. Uh, I eliminated dairy first because I do have a genetic lactose issue. And then I eliminated gluten as well, which uh, is more cognitive for me than anything else. So those are two of the, probably the two biggest changes that made the biggest difference for me. Uh, And then there was a bunch of other ones, even uh, a 24 year old, I had performance issues. So that was a mess. Wow. And yeah, and that was really the big, the big eye opener where I realized I need to understand what's going on in my body more. Part of it was also, I started losing my hair at a young age and I used finasteride, uh, which is Propecia, at like 23, and that just destroyed me. That's actually what made the performance issues is probably at their worst. So, you know, yeah. to fix yourself and to learn the right way to do things. Oh, I also had heavy metal toxicity on top of it, um, and this was all before the age of 24. But you must have seen this with your clients as well and started pointing those things out to them? Yeah. So that was the big thing was that when we were working with the clients, we had ones that would be very consistent with their training and would show up, but they weren't changing. And let's just say a number of 50-50. Some got great results and some didn't. And, you know, it wasn't for lack of trying. So you think, well, it's, it's, you know, either they're lying to you or there's more to this. And I had a pretty honest client base where they told me a lot of personal things. So I didn't picture them as the type to be lying, be lying to me at the time. So 
you know, I, I dug deeper, used my own experiences. I, as you said earlier, I did a lot with the Paul Quinn principles. A lot of doors opened through that. I met a lot of really good practitioners, learned a lot of quality lab tests. And when you go to find this uh, lab interpretation that's outside of the normal box of what you can get um, through your insurance or at your MD, you have to find practitioners that are also looking for it. And usually the ones that are looking for these better tests and are using them and distributing them uh, often had a wider base of knowledge. Mm. And I learned from work with them. Awesome. Well, so all of those things actually were beneficial for you, even though at the time I'm sure they didn't feel like it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Awesome. Spot on. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul, what about yourself? Um, well, I started fitness through, um, through just my studies. I was doing uh, studying biochemistry in university. And I was um, the fitness manager of the club. He had a similar background. And he knew that I was in, um, I, I was in studying biochemistry as well. And he wanted to, uh, he showed me the ropes in terms of, um, uh, learning the fitness industry. I then became like a fitness manager. I was in, it was in charge of running the, um, fitness evaluations for, for people in the club. So that's how I got started in the, um, fitness industry. Okay. And then how did you sort of break away from that into your own business? Cause you've been, you're running your own business. Yeah, like well, years. I mean, as far as bringing it to my own business, I so studying biochemistry is interesting. Like, I I liked the analysis side. I didn't like the the isolation side, you know, because I I and for that end, I was always interested in more uh, what could effectively make changes for people at a more personal level, um, because uh, it's you know the the biochemical process is great. You understand metabolic pathways. You understand how things react in the body, but it left me thinking like I did, I was never really a fan of just like through drug mediation because I felt like, well, if, if people, you know, these things are, 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 are these substances are in natural thing, products and foods, why not learn about the, the, um, where they're coming from naturally so that I can effectively help in a, in a better way. Um, and I, and I basically, um, took that information and, and went from there. Um, because again, I was always, I, for me, I could effectively make a better change with people. I felt if I worked with them on a personal level. Mm, interesting. Yeah. And then the other thing I guess I wanted to ask you is how did your, tr your own personal training change from when you first started <laughs> out of school, Nick, until now? So I wanted to be a bodybuilder, natural bodybuilding. I was really into that. A lot of my friends did it in college. I don't have the frame for it. And I soon realized that. Plus, I was so imbalanced and so immobile. I was getting injured all the time. I was getting injuries that some of my clients get in like their 30s and 40s in my early 20s. And it was just a lot of imbalances, a lot of improper training. I then moved into sports performance training because I thought it'd be fun to work with athletes. Through the Pollock stuff, I really got into that. Um, had a great internship with Ben Prentice training uh, hockey players in Connecticut. And that, that was an amazing experience. But it just didn't really drive me. So from there, I thought, well, I want to be a little more competitive. I got really into weightlifting and I worked with a really cool group of weightlifters, but I could never get my numbers as high as some of the other ones because I started getting really bad hip issues and there was just a lot of pain. So then it brought me into mobility, which brought me to a degree of gymnastic strength training, not yes, gymnastic bodies, but kind of looking into all of that where it just started to really work. And I was supposed to take a seminar with one coach and they didn't. Uh, they couldn't show up for it and they pulled in Coach Summer. And when they pull Coach Summer in, I just, that's where I first met Paul. He was in Rhode Island and I just loved it. I went home and bought all four levels of foundation that night. Then I, I but I still liked weightlifting. So I was trying to do both. But what I realized is with my schedule and I don't have the best recovery in terms of, I don't really respond as well to a super high training frequency. So I soon realized I couldn't do both and I felt better and was getting stronger and liked the idea of being able to build a level of strength that was specific, but broadly usable. And that really just, that built my pathway and I just really honed in on gymnastic strength training from there and And how loved long ago it. was that? Uh, five years ago now. Okay. And yeah. so by what, like five years ago, you also stopped the weight training or when I did you I stopped the weight training about four. Okay, and were you concerned at all by stopping that that you would lose strength or mass or anything? Well, the aesthetics was definitely something that I was curious about just because I didn't have experience with it. Um, I found it was about a, a little bit of a U-curve where I lost a little bit of strength in the beginning at max strength. I would say 
max strength isn't the right word. I lost a little bit of being able to handle heavier loads at volume. But as my strength grew and I moved to higher progressions, I actually surpassed some of the lifts and there was a really strong translation. Um, one cool thing was I didn't do any back squatting um, for nine months because I wanted to see how my hip would heal through all the mobility. And I just did a lot of unilateral work and a little bit of jump training because I just really enjoy it and mobility. And I was able to maintain my max back squat at the nine month mark after not touching the bar for nine months. So that was pretty cool. That's awesome. And yeah. so now would you say you haven't done any of that type of lifting for what, four years or? I, re I like to do a lower body lifting day where I hit deadlifts or squats because I enjoy it. And I do like a little bit of the hypertrophy element of having the load on me. But for upper body, we get so much volume with the gymnastic strength that and moving your body weight with your upper body, you're, you know, it's a different different mass you're moving where uh, smaller muscles on bigger movements. Um, I don't see the need for the upper body stuff as much anymore. It's interesting because looking at you, like you're looking at your physique and I'm sure you must get this all the time. People must just think you're a weightlifter and not just, I mean, not just using your own body weight. Well, it was funny. The first time we were at the first gymnastic body seminar I took in Denver at Awaken Gymnastics, um, I actually got two of the uh, athletes there that hired me for health management because they wanted more aesthetics out of it. And what I found was that I built a strong foundation of weight training, which helped put it on me, but also my genetics are, are good for putting size on the frame I have. Granted, it wasn't big enough for bodybuilding, but it, into the gymnastics world, it's a pretty good size frame compared to some people. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. And Paul, what about yourself? Well, I mean, I, it's interesting. Um, coach, um, Coach Summer, yeah, he would typify my body is you know, more like what um, Nick was saying, because like, I'm more someone who holds on to muscle. So I also just, I like the aesthetics of bodybuilding and I appreciated what that did for me. But just, I've always liked gymnastics strength training and actually what my process was I started training with a coach in gymnastics. Like I was learning like the actual apparatus and actual um, um, elements in gymnastics. So, and what I was finding, I was reaching like a plateau in my ability to get better in gymnastics. And I'm, I definitely remember my coach said to me, basically, if you don't, increase your mobility, it's not going to get any better. And that's kind of how I discovered the gymnastics bodies programming. I felt like I looked at it and I was like, that's exactly what I need to focus in on to get to my specific elements. Because I think this happens to a lot of people. You look at something like for, for me, um, issues where I have to work on more mobility are areas like the hips and certain mid and low back, low back muscles. And you look at it and you kind of, you, you say to yourself, like, I can't, I don't, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can gain that kind of mobility in, the, in, your, in whatever part, those parts of your body are. And it's, it's so interesting. I, just for, for me, as I see myself saying that, I'm like, wow, I'm turning into what I hear myself or clients saying. And I'm thinking, my God, it's happening on that level. <laughs> But, it, and, but for that reason, though, it made me drill down into the work and say, hey, what's going on? Why can I not do this? And it made me look at to really look at what do I need to do to basically to allow myself to create that um, range of motion in my body. Mm -hmm. I'm similar to Nick in the sense that people look at me and say, oh, you must do bodybuilding all the mm -hmm. time. I haven't touched like weights in terms <laughs> of like squats and bench pressing, I mean, four or five years. I've been doing um, gymnastic strength training, let's say definitely over 10 years. And I feel that it's the val, you know, how it's helped my body change is it's got so many more layers. And um, it's kind of like the sport itself. It's like, it just keeps growing in terms of what you can do because each time you think you're at a level of ability, there's more to learn, there's more to do, which I find just for me, just mentally stimulating. It allows me to say, you know, it allows me to know that I can continue to work on things that um, balance my body. You know, mm -hmm. because to me, one of the things I like about the training is that it's such a balanced aesthetic between um, mobility and, um, and strength. Mm -hmm. And I think that to me ultimately speaks volumes about what the whole um, training is. Mm -hmm. And I want to come back to that point about mobility and strength. Sure. But before I do, I really want to find out from you, I mean, you, I mean you're, you're, you're a big build. Mm -hmm. 
Do you just get that big from gymnastics or do you think it's something that you've built up with your, your weightlifting and then well, you haven't lost it? Yeah, I have, how does it work? I have like, a, again, a mesomorphic body in terms of like I'll hold on to more mass, you know, in things that I do or even some, you know, I think coaches are like, you know, I can just look at a weight and, and my body will grow. <laughs> but, it's, but by the same token, you know, the, um, how my body functions is a byproduct of what I'm doing, how I'm training. Mm. You know, like, it's interesting, like, a lot of the um, upper body work in gymnastics deals with um, a lot of these upper shoulder areas, a lot mm. of these um, upper chest, um, uh, like, say, the pec minor and all these muscles around there, that in ways, even just working on rings, even just holding support on the rings, like, you need those muscles, like, unless you work those strengths in those specific ways, you don't develop that. And I think people looking at an aesthetic, they look at someone and they say, oh, they, the person has a certain muscle size, but the underlying parts of their aesthetics are more internal. It's not just the muscles you see on the surface. These mm -hmm. muscles are actually deeper. Mm -hmm. And they're and ultimately they're called tonic muscles. They're even stronger because they're support they're supporting the weights of the bones against each other. So ultimately they have a a, um, a larger capacity. Right. But because we don't train them, they're some they're they're deconditioned and undertrained, you know, and this is deals with the connective tissue and all these other kinds mm -hmm. of things. It's what makes the body look the way it is and the shape it is. Because I think when we're looking at people, we're not just looking at you know their bodies, we're looking at the shape of their bodies. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, interesting. And so you guys are speaking a lot about this strength and mobility. And I go to like different gyms around Manhattan, around the world, mm -hmm. um, and I don't necessarily see that as much. What, what have you guys seen over, say, the last 20 years in New York itself and then in, in gym and health with, with regards to health and fitness? Mm. And how has that sort of changed and where are we now, do you think? Nick, do you? Uh, yeah, I think in the last 20, well, for me it would probably be more like the last 15 years I have a better perspective on with this. But there's definitely been more of a focus on movement for sure. And that's, that's growing rapidly now uh, versus, you know, just getting in and pumping up. People used to either go to the gym and lift a lot of weight to pump up or they'd lift a lot of weight to get strong. That was generally the two areas. Or you would be on the other end of the spectrum and you'd be doing yoga or, you know, dancing or something. And I know those are not the same, but where it was more movement based and uh, there was not as much resistance training to it. There were a few disciplines. I would actually say dancers are one where they were doing both, but most weren't. Uh, now there's more of a focus on the community, things that bring community and aspect. That's a really big change now because bodybuilding has become such an isolated sport. I think people are moving away from That's one of the main reasons, actually. I think people are moving away from it is you don't have a community. It's just you. Mm. Mm. So you think we're sort of heading towards that movement aspect? Yeah, I think there's a large movement towards it. There's also, you know, I would say actually there's really a split in the movement. I would say that there's a, a two groups. I'm going to be broad with this. One's a little smaller and that's the group where people are really getting educated and they're learning and they're looking and they're trying to find how can I be my best? How can I have long-term performance? Uh, how can I ex like excel in life at a high level? Then there's, in my opinion, a larger group, which is more like being told that this is what you do, go do it. And there's a ton of options now. And unfortunately that that group uh, kind of feeds our business because you know they, we call them uh, reformed athletes where they choose a sport, choose an activity, and they go real hard at it, which is great because it's good that they're doing something, but they're not balancing themselves out. And the body can only go like that for so long before it breaks down. And now that there are more options like what we do, people that are breaking down are seeing, oh, well, I wish I did this sooner, but at least I found it now. Yeah. Mm, I think that feeds into the whole, um, I think sitting culture has definitely affected that. Because I think totally. your body... You know, it, it sends you signals, it sends you signs that, you know, you can ignore, 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 and then all of a sudden you're forced to make a choice. And then all the things that are happening, because again, these things are happening internally, then eventually they start to express themselves externally. And it's like, you have to do something. Like, I mean, people love to do spinning now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you know, the issue that, you know, we find with it is like, you're strengthening what's already strong, so you do more of it. So then they're getting spin and they're getting hip issues and, and low back issues. But it's like that adrenaline feeds us so much. Like you have a movement uh, based system like, um, you know, let's say example, CrossFit. They are, they're a big movement system as well, you know. But interestingly enough, they're, 
there's still a, a very adrenaline based model of just like do more and do more of it. You know, and again, with, with something like that, from an injury standpoint, injuries forced that whole industry to address what was causing the injuries, right? So they have to make that change because your body is, it's an intelligent system. I mean, thank God it's, it's created the way it is because it's like you, you get these signals that tells you, okay, where do I go next, right? And if you listen to it, you can basically make a better decision to make a better choice. You know, I think sitting culture, I mean, you see that now with kids that are younger mm -hmm. and they're sitting for longer amounts of time, they're on their devices, they're doing all these things. They're getting these things at a younger age than people that perhaps didn't have that when we didn't, we weren't, we weren't uh, doing those things in the, in the same way. So I think there's two pushes, like what Nick said, you know, sports like bodybuilding are very um, niche specific and they're almost coming somewhat dinosaur-like. And then you have the, this movement culture that's getting bigger, but I think it's what's, what kind of um, drives that is this need to basically, you know, give their body um, something that makes them feel, you know, um, healthy in a, in a real way. So, yeah. Mm. I, I think there's another problem with that too, is, is that people often say, now I'm, I'm 30, I'm gonna be 32 next month. And I've got friends that have been saying this stuff to me for years now. Oh, my knees hurt, my hips yeah. hurt, my back hurts. Oh, yeah. well, you know, it's just because I'm getting older. Yeah, yeah. They're not 50, you know. And they're not using their body, and that's why. And then they'll also say, and you know, I don't want to rag on spin because if that's your activity and it's the one thing you're going to do and you're going to show up, I think that's great you're showing up. Yeah. But, the, you know, I can think of many people that are like, oh, how do I work my glutes? Yeah. How do I work my glutes? Yeah. And I'm like, well, what are you doing? Oh, I do spin all the time. And I tell them, well, that's counterproductive for your goal. You yeah. can do it, but you need to be doing the other things too. Oh, I don't want to stop doing that. Yeah. And I was like, well, can you spend twice as much time doing the opposite? No. Yeah. Well, then what do you want? You know, people are unrealistic it's, with it's, their expectations. It's convenient. I mean, you can get, you can, you get off work, go to spin class. Yeah. Mm. You know, it's quick and easy. So as a trainer, you must find this all the time where someone comes in with goals mm -hmm. and if you really look deeply at their goals, they're very different to what they're doing. So <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is what you want is not necessarily what you need. Yeah. Yeah. How do you approach something like that? Can you even give an example of a yeah, client that you totally? Well, you have help? to put you have to put the you have to put it on them, mm. and we're your guide. We will give you everything that you need to get there. Yeah. But you have to realize that you're the one that's going to get there. I can't show up and work out for you. I can't be there with you the other twenty three hours of the day. And that's saying someone trains with me, you know, five days a week. Let's say, which I have people that do. I have people that don't. And they have to realize that I think the best way to do that is you give them goals based on what they tell you and you see if they can achieve them. Because if somebody says, I'm, you know, let's, let's use aesthetics, for example, I'm 20% body fat and I want to get down to 15. Well, I, I can't get you there right away because most people have to change habits. Mm -hmm. So I look at your worst habits, whether it's training related or lifestyle related, and I'll take those pieces and I'll make micro goals that over X amount of months, we're going to get you to that goal and we'll set that timeline. And if they can't get through month one, then they have to realize, okay, we'll give you a second try at this. Two months of failing, well, they're obviously not really ready to commit. So they will either have two things happen. One, they're either gonna quit, or two, they're gonna work harder and they're gonna realize that, okay, I need to reevaluate what my major goal is and adjust to get maybe a more minor goal first that can lead me to that major goal in a longer time period. And that happens a lot. Mm. And do you think personal training has changed over time? I mean, I know that you guys Definitely. do it differently. Mm. But are there still people out there who just go, right, well, you've got an hour with me, I'm going to smash you? Sure. Sure. I'd sure. say it's most well, of the what, industry. Absolutely. Is it? Yeah. Because, I mean, yeah. I'm amongst people like you guys who, you know, don't fit that at all. Yeah. But then I go into an average gym and I see it all the time. What what sort of percentages well, are we talking I, about? The, rea the reality is I think it comes off of not exactly understanding what their um, – what the client is actually dealing with, and and the and the difficulty of realization of what it takes in some cases to change what needs to be changed, and and people show you know they as they kind of look at it, you know they, maybe they look at something and it's like oh my god I can't believe it's made, this is what's happening in my body, and I think for people it's it's just it feels somewhat defeating. And, um, and when they, when they show up to, it, they're like, whoa. And for a lot of people, they just kind of want to kind of, kind of just not look at it in the same way. But the reality is that, that dedication and that focus to make that change, it's so much more empowering than doing, you know, over strengthening what's strong and making what's weak 
in, inordinately weaker because just your body always works in a state of balance, right? If you overstrength on one side, you're going to weaken the other. There's no reason for that those areas to get stronger. You have to give it a good reason. So if you actually if you actually do that in terms of your training and conditioning, that I I believe is going to give people the result they're looking for. Yeah, I think also with that, there's no real standardization of of uh, certification or schooling with this. I mean, obviously you can get someone with great certs or you know great schooling. And yeah, that's somebody that you probably look more towards because at least you know they have a strong background. But you could, I could walk off the street right now, go online, get a certification, be a personal trainer. And that brings you to the next point. And the other point is that people see what they like and want to be that. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is there's genetics. And people's genetics are just going to be better than other people's. And maybe what they're doing for their genetics works for them. While, you know, you, you, what they're going to do that same thing for someone else it's just not. And I think that's one way, one place where Paul and I have excelled is that we've been able to work towards optimizing ourselves, but not just because we do it this way, because we understand the system. Mm. Mm. That's a really good point. And I mean, you get people, I'm sure, who say, oh, what do you eat? Oh, mm -hmm. God. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and you say, well, do you want to know about my sleep as well? Yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> like, well, if you've yeah. got to take, if you're going to copy what I do, let's copy everything. But even, but, yeah, you and, go and have my genes as well. Yeah. No, but I, I, I tell, I try to, be, and I know Nick's great at this. I try to be as honest as I can. I do not tell people like I'm getting eight hours of sleep every single night. <laughs> it's not true. Yeah. I, I want to, but the reality is, like, I, I, I try to speak about where I have my deficits, and I know I can be more optimal mm -hmm. because at the end of the day life always shows up, right? This, it's not easy, right? Yeah. To make these kinds of changes, it, it kind of forces you to look at something and actually say, well, if I'm, like what Nick was talking about, if, I, if I'm getting this same result each time and I'm not willing to look at what's making me get the same result, maybe I'm not looking at the whole picture. And we say this all the time. You're talking to somebody in a conversation, like, yeah, 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 I get it, I get it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the reality is they actually don't get it. <laughs> Because they're, they're, in, they're intellectualized what they assume that needs to happen. It's not showing up, but in their mind, they have this reason as to why. Mm -hmm. And because the reason and the action don't match up, it just always seems to hit to that same spot. So, but it's like, you know, part of our job is to help give you at least enough information to see, okay, this is why it's showing up. When, it's, when it shows up and you kind of keep pushing it away, that's, that's your, um, your, it's on you at that point. Mm. So, look, a lot of our listeners are into performance, and so they have performance goals as well. Um, so, I guess it's finding that balance of time. And so, so, I'll give you an example. We might have listeners who are triathletes, and so they have three disciplines to train for. That's a lot right. a amongst everything else they do in their life. So, what sort of advice would you give to someone like that who? are probably going to be these people that are working those muscles yeah. that they shouldn't be working as much as others. Periodize your training. Okay. So what do you mean by that? Well, if you want to do it, if you're looking at your year, look at when you're going to start training for what. You can't do a triathlon every quarter of the year. And technically you could, but if you want to perform at your best, we can only, what, I, what how, how long is it that we can peak ourselves? You can peak yourself once. I think in six week cycles. Yeah, yeah, but like you can get like one full peak a year or, yeah. or two. If you can get one, one full peak a year, that is phenomenal. Right. You look, at, you look at athletes in different disciplines. To be able to peak all year long, it's so unrealistic. Right. But I think people go on, and it's particularly, I mean, in this city, New York, it's so hard charging. They're like, I need to be alpha every single day. Yeah. Not gonna happen. You know, it's, it's actually just, totally it's just, beta because right? you're losing. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's but it's like the belief is like, oh, I can do that because I'm so high performing, and then when that shows up, you hit burnout. Yeah. Then there's a whole other cascade of things that happen. And I hit that. So, so it's you know and it's and it's <laughs> it's not fun. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, but the reality peaking is is difficult to peak all year long. Mm -hmm. It's great. If you can kind of, you know, you can you can periodize your um, your training that you can peak at certain points. But the reality is, we're kind of going on up slopes and down slopes, and then being enough to kind of have those differences not so big. The amplitudes of those shifts not so big. Yeah, you you can take your sport, whatever that may be, such as triathletes who have three disciplines in a sport, and you can continue to keep that in your diet. But you need to have a time of rebalancing. You need to have a time of strengthening. And then you need to have a time to work power output. And then you need to focus specifically that on your skills. So if you look at your year and you say, I've got one or two, 
you know, triathlons I would do, or at least I'm going to put them all in this window, depending on what someone's body can take, how much they can do in recovery and whatnot. And they look at their year and they block it out with a, you know, working with a good coach or figuring it out on your own. That's a game changer. I mean, you see CrossFit's a different sport, but the top guys are periodizing their training. They're not showing up five days a week doing CrossFit. Yeah. I mean, and if they are, it's deloaded or it's specific elements. And I, I don't know why they don't realize this. Maybe when you go to the facilities, they don't make it that apparent. But all you have to do is a little research on top guys' training programs. Yeah. You know, maybe not in men's health, but yeah. do, you know, dig a little deeper. Yeah, and to do those kinds of med cons, you know, um, every day of the week, yeah. your adrenals are just beyond and, and you know there's always going to be a genetic freak out there yeah. that's going to be the person that's going to be on the magazine mm. and that's going to be in your face and then the other 99.9 percent that can't do that you know, are never going to achieve their best mm. yeah. really good point yeah exactly there's always a standout person yeah but that's yeah. not the person that you should be no and that's who they're that's who they're put i mean you, you know every once in a while you get someone that might be both mm. but that's going to be rare mm. so that's awesome advice now what advice would you give to our listeners who, let's say, maybe they're getting to the point where actually performance isn't actually their main goal. What they actually want is longevity, yeah. health, yeah. and fitness. Yeah. So they want an overall, they feel like they're getting a bit old like myself, mm-hmm. and they just want to find what's going to make them feel really good and perform really well in life. What advice or what would you say, I guess there's two questions here, is how would you find a personal trainer? How would you go about finding out the finding the right personal trainer for yourself? And also, regardless of personal trainer or not, what things would you implement? What type of training would you implement? I think uh, one, they should go get biomarkers tested because mm-hmm. there's a lot of trial and error that we do. And the older you get, the less time you have for the trial and the error. And uh, having a firm understanding of what your body needs and wants. And I'm a big fan of uh, DNA testing towards athletic performance because there's a lot of them out there. You can test your DNA and find your ancestry and that's cool. But that doesn't help me make myself better and my longevity better. And then with that, finding a personal trainer. Um, you do you have to do your research, talk to people, go find, read reviews. And granted, those aren't always going to be there. But if they have certifications on there, people look at them and go, oh, wow, that's a lot of certifications. Go look at a few of them. Go see what kind of athletes they're turning out. You know, see what kind of, you know, what kind of performance and end game they happen. And also you got to find someone that does something that you find interesting. Because if someone says you got to go to my guy, he's the best. And maybe he is the best, but you hate the way he's training and you're not going to show up. Then you're not going to listen. Then you're back at square one. Mm. Mm. I think in the it's age of social media, it's um, the, the capacity to find other either trainers or trainers or just what people are doing is, um, is greater because you kind of see the product of their work on their social media pages. Sometimes you see them, sometimes you see the clients, but you have some idea of what they're doing. And I think it makes it, you know, it's kind of like a, somewhat of a business card that shows what shows people, you know, um, what you're doing. And I think even, even if you want to just start there and just kind of scroll through some of that work and say, maybe this, this looks like it speaks to me. It speaks to like some, something that I could get from that. Because if you have an issue, be it a back issue or be, you know, a knee issue, whatever, and, and maybe that's what that's your first way in. Maybe it's um, issues with your diet, and you say, you know, this is what I want to have dressed. And I would say, whoever you kind of select based upon that process, that's how I would evaluate what they're doing. Mm. Can they actually focus in on what you want, your specific goal? That's funny advice, actually, from you, Paul, because mm. I tried to do a bit of research on you, and there's nothing on social media because you don't have time because you're actually <laughs> doing what you preach, <laughs> which I think is awesome. And what amazed me was yeah. I, 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 can't, you, I mean, you hardly even answer your emails, let alone <laughs> do social media. But what I loved about you, and in mm-hmm. fact, I didn't tell you this, but I joined a group yeah. um, that was the Manhattan Fitness Professionals. So okay. all these B&I? professionals. Um, it was actually a Facebook group. Okay. Um, you wouldn't know about that because you're never on Facebook. But um, <laughs> I don't. Know but just so you know, I actually put it out there saying who would be like the best trainer in Manhattan yeah. for me to interview. Yeah. And your name came up more than anyone else's. And this is this is from actual fitness professionals, not from That's the general awesome. public. That's funny. So. <laughs> 
Um, I found that I found that not only awesome but also very interesting yeah. because people that don't have time to make themselves a big name on social media yeah. may be the actual people that you want to see. So, sure. okay, against advice. your advice, very um, <laughs> very good advice. Thank but, you. But another thing I guess I'd add to that too is um, maybe you know in your consult you can actually pick up on how they talk to you um, and find like just look at the questions maybe that they're asking you sure. rather than let's get straight into it and do a workout yeah. um, attitude, which is the opposite to what you guys do. So Yeah. Yeah. We, and we, like you said, we start all of our assessments and consults. Well, our consults are just sitting down and talking, but our assessments start with the intro of the consult. Mm. So we sit down and we go over their goals because you have to know what you're targeting. Yeah. We, yeah, we have yeah. a specific picture we want to build, but what materials are we working with? Mm. But I guess in argument to these younger or not necessarily younger, but some other personal trainers, yeah. they only get paid by the hour. And in a lot of cases, they're not earning much because they're not working for themselves. And so I guess they have a bit of a different mentality about what they need to get done in the hour, whereas working for yourself and you guys, you're just taking a totally different approach. Well, that's mm. why the boutique gym is big in New York City. And mm. yeah. you, know, you, you have your chains, mm. but the personal memberships are what drives that mm. yeah. while well, personal training and group classes is more what drives the boutique yeah so on that boutique business mm -hmm. you guys are both um in your own right amazing personal trainers and have your own business just there in personal mm -hmm. training but you've come together to create a more of a boutique not just personal training but also classes yeah um from a financial perspective that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because you, you you know you make two hundred dollars an hour in personal training. What the group classes? You're not going to make as much money, mm -hmm. especially the boutique sort of classes and the amount of effort that you put into them. Mm -hmm. What's your whole thinking behind doing this? Well, basically, um, we feel the work is really important. It's uh, important in a lot of different ways, and people. We definitely feel the desire is out there pretty strongly for people to learn this type of training um, or even you call it conservative conditioning system so for us it's it's more about getting um, athletes or you know uh, to basically experience the work in the ways that produce larger larger changes you know because maybe in the beginning it's not purely the the biggest financial um, end but if that's the only reason why you're doing it it's probably not going to be the the thing that kind of motiv motivates you to continue, right? At the end of the day, I think it has to have some resonance as to why, you know, what, what, you know, kind of the why, why do you even do it? Why do you even do it in the first place? Um, but I think I really do feel from what we've seen, that's producing other um, financial angles to it. But we feel that the work is that, um, that we're bringing to people and helping to bring through the gymnastics bodies, conditioning system and programming it's uh, it's really um, it's really um, totally uh, helpful because we're seeing it in the athletes right now. I mean, people are gone through this iteration of how we're doing um, uh, transform GST in the last what's say, October, mm -hmm. and have already seen like very very noticeable changes mm -hmm. in what's happened with the athletes. Yeah, I've had some some uh, students that are athletes that were taking the classes when I was not working with Paul that I've seen more result in the last three months than we saw in the year they were working. And our classes were good, but we didn't have the volume. It wasn't the same. Um, we didn't have the availability of space to have, offer more classes. And what we were teaching, I had to get certain principles in in those times versus being able to expand. But going back to the financial side, I actually disagree with that. Mm. I think given our current situation, that, that seems true and that's in the short term. But in the long term, there's actually much growth. There's a much higher ceiling on how much you can earn mm. um, in group work for two reasons. One, when we're in the proper facility that allows you to do what you need, um, the price point does exceed what you can make per hour on your own. Secondly, you can make that money and disperse it between your employees on your, and yourself without having to put as many man hours in. And third, um, I lost my train of thought, but there was a third point. It was that, oh, you get a, you get a completely insane amount of people coming through your door mm. and you know i could you could charge 250 dollars an hour but if you're not seeing people mm. then it, you know your five hours a day isn't going to equate good i'm glad you argued with me there yeah. because also i guess too those clients potentially 
can't afford to do the personal training. Mm. And so you feel like now you can actually offer this amazing training to anyone. That was super rewarding when I started doing group classes mm. because I had a large demographic of people that I wanted to work with mm-hmm. and that really wanted it mm. yeah. and they couldn't afford it. Yeah. And you know, they could, they'll, they'll still hire for one-on-ones here and there. Check mm. my assessment. Oh, I've been mm. noticing this. What can I, you know, what can I do? Can you look at me? Because they know they'll get more out of that and they find the value in it. And one of the most rewarding things I have is I have a group of people that have actually many have tra- uh, transitioned to transform, but we're coming to me every, let's say two to eight weeks and we're doing everything they were supposed to outside. And I would, if I don't see someone for eight weeks that's doing everything they're supposed to, that I'm helping them program and they are, you know, two or three steps ahead where they were eight weeks ago, that is so rewarding. Totally. Yeah. No, that's so true. Um, and yeah, I guess also coming back to your earlier point about the community. Oh, you're, yeah. build, you're building what yeah. everyone wants, mm-hmm. which that, is community. And that's, I mean, you know, uh, you, people talk about that. Like, basically, you, it's hard to do the work, you know, on your own. Even in a one-on-one setting, in that community-based environment, you're kind of doing the things you, you hate to do the most, mm-hmm. but they're the most rewarding. And they actually produce bigger changes, mm-hmm. you know, in your body. And that mm-hmm. community basically helps to build that, mm-hmm. right? Really, it, makes it, it actually makes it possible. There's a dynamic that you have in a group you do not have in a one-on-one setting. Totally. Mm. Yeah. And then, well, ahead. I've got to say, I um I had a, a bad injury, a shoulder injury, and I've always wanted to get into. I heard about Chris Summers and I heard about gymnastics, and I always wanted to get into it. And never really did. And then um, as soon as I found out I was coming to New York, I knew about Nick and I thought this is the time. And then with my shoulder, I was thinking there's no way I can do anything. And quite the opposite, it's actually been really amazing rehab for mm-hmm. me yeah. it's also great because you you basically start from scratch yeah. it's very humbling yeah. and you you just build up strength and you can't uh, we were having this conversation the other day paul you can't cheat because your body doesn't allow you to go further than what you're actually capable of doing yeah. which i think is amazing yeah can you give us just for the listeners out there who don't know about Chris Summers and about the gymnastics bodies, mm. what is it? What does the training look like, and why should everyone do it? Well, uh, Coach um, Christopher Summer is a is a um, he was a junior national uh, coach for the um, uh, Olympic uh, team for the junior nationals. You have senior nationals. There's the different levels of team for for men's gymnastics, and um, he had a program that he basically developed through many years. He had a um, had a gym originally in Arizona, and he had a particular athlete, and his name is Alan Bauer, who he basically um, kind of took through, uh, well, basically coached for, I don't know, 12 years plus, who is now on, he was on a junior national team, now he's on a senior national team, he's actually soon to be competing in the America's Cup. So, but a lot of coaches um, don't, like, don't, know, don't like to necessarily work with adults, because for one, it's too challenging. They have all these mobility gaps and all these just their their bodies feel like concrete. And it's it's very time intensive to work when you have to deal with so many issues. But coach was really patient enough and he took a lot of notes over time, working with other coaches, different um, different countries, and just like kind of getting their their kernels and refining his own system, which became the gymnastics body system. And it's a very, and the system itself is very um, uh, progressive. So you have um, seven foundation movements. um, And through each foundation, what you're dealing with, all the different supports um, of the body, be it from the upper body, lower body, um, and all the different um, uh, systems that make the body uh, whole, uh, mobile and, and strong. So basically you have seven foundations and with that you also have the embedded uh, mobility that goes with that. So it's a very comprehensive system and it deals with um, the things that make the, the athlete um, balanced in the way that makes them makes makes effective. Yeah, mm. most, most adult athletes are generally gonna need more mobility than strength. And the way the gymnastic bodies programming is set up, you're never, if you're doing it right, you're never doing more, uh, less than a one-to-one ratio of strength to mobility. But if you're really doing it right, that's gonna turn more into a one and a half to three times how much strength you're doing. And you'll notice your strength gains, your strength gains come a lot more quickly when you're mobile and when you're balanced. Um, another few things with the program I think that's great is that coach is the first one to say that 
his affiliate coaches are his biggest is his biggest assets and the program has changed since you know i've done it four years ago and he will they will go out and make a whole change to one of the foundations and coach will be the first one to say guys this is what we thought was the best it wasn't uh, an example would be for human flag or side lever. If people know that one. Yeah. They they revamped the yeah. program drastically because he said, you know what? This wasn't the best. This mm. is the best. And now we're doing that. A lot of people at his level would not let their ego get out of the way to do that because yeah. they're already making money. He's like, it's good enough. The other thing that's great about the programming is that there's nothing that's as methodical and as planned as it is. Uh, I've done programming with other coaches prior to meeting Coach Summer and doing gymnastic bodies. And injured my shoulder, um, injured my knee, never had any injury before that. And I'm not gonna say everyone's gonna get injured doing it, but there's a reason we're doing anything. We made a point you guys brought up earlier saying that you can't cheat. Well, you can cheat. You're just gonna get hurt yeah. or you're gonna get stuck. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. And you can cheat, but you'll get yeah, hurt. Yeah, and sure. you, don't, you don't need to get stuck and you don't mm. need to get injured. Mm. If you wanna take the fast path and mm. you know your repercussions, Mm. From what you said, Ali, about the shoulder mobility, mm. there is no other um, conditioning system that I've used so far that's been as com complete I found for shoulder mobility. Agreed. Mm. You know, most people they 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 start to learn things like the um, dislocates or the weighted dislocates. Mm. You know, the weighted stretching would deal with the connective tissue, and they're like, "You got to be you're, yep. you're out of your mind," mm. because basically they feel. You know, just call it, for lack of a better word, just junk that's in like mm -hmm. areas like the shoulder and the hip. Mm -hmm. And they're like, there's no way. It's it's searing pain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're like, you're nuts. <laughs> Why would I do mm -hmm. this? But it's exactly what we need to do. Mm -hmm. And that for that reason, it, it, it changes the whole shoulder, you know, strength and mobility anatomy in a way that all of a sudden it's like, my shoulder feels good. <laughs> mm. And not only your shoulder, but it, your whole body feels good. Yeah. And I think it's that that combination of that strength and mobility together. Yeah. It Unlike other sports, you go and do it, you feel quite smashed. Yeah. But you feel sore yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Whereas this, you actually feel great. Well, afterwards. like we were saying yesterday, it's, it's low impact. Mm. All of this technically at this mm. level, it's all low impact mm. work. Mm. So you're not having this ballistic smashing. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, coach talks about this all the time. You have to prep your body for that type, those types of impacts. So, you know, you know, Jim is doing, you know, um, acrobatic passes, like say on the floor, they're coming out with sometimes, you know, many multiples of body weight. So, but they strengthen their joints to be able to support that kind of load on their body. Mm. So they're ready for it. But mm. most people don't even know where they are. You know, their, um, their, their, their supports are not very even through their, through their body. And then when they load, because if you're loading force, it can go, you know, directly straight on. But it, there's also all these other angles mm -hmm. that force are coming at you. So if your body's not strong and equally or equal or balanced enough in those ranges, mm. you, you, your force then torques to the weaker angle, you're shot. Mm. You know, it's, it's a, you know, whatever the joint is, you know, it's kind of gets um, thrown out. So. The only problem I have with it and the reason why I think that it hasn't, well, there's two reasons why I think it hasn't totally taken off yet, which I'm sort of excited about because I don't, almost don't want it, I want to keep it a secret. <laughs> but at the same time, I know how good it is for everyone that it should just be out there. Yeah. Is one that you guys just haven't had a chance to market it yet. Mm. But um, I know I know it's going to be become massive. But the, the thing that is really stopping it, I think, is that, it's quite the the word gymnastics is actually quite uh, scary mm -hmm. for a lot of people. Yeah. A lot of um, people that need it, which is pretty much everyone, to as an adult to go and start gymnastics just yeah. isn't comprehensible. Sure, I mean your child might go and do it, and yeah. you might go watch your child, but that's it. Yeah, and it's not like that. Yeah, it's very. It starts off very basic, and yeah. you're not going out there to be a performer like on a beam yeah um and so i think it's the whole wording around it sure that turns people off and yet it's the most amazing thing but but, but i think people are hearing that they're seeing like you just described it like they're thinking why can their the kids go do it because the kids don't have the mobility gaps that the parents now have mm. right so basically you know what the program does you know um it basically fixes those mobility gaps. Mm. So then whatever you want to do, say you have no desire to do anything gymnastic related, but you just want to have a better shoulder or a better knee or a better hip, 
it gives you that on just the most basic level. You can do whatever you want. I think it's, you know, the thing, it's our, you know, you, you know, the good thing about the bodies and having the bodies that we do, it's like to feel strong that you can do whatever you want. I think that's the thing that gives people the most, you know, uh, enjoyment. Mm. You know, you want to play golf, you want to be better mm. golfer, play basketball, whatever it is. Anything you, you know? want to do, it's, yeah. it's the best thing. It's movement. Yeah. yeah. But but I guess that the word name. gymnastics well, maybe puts people off. Yeah, but then you think about it. Well, all right, what are other things you can call it? Because I've thought about this too. Mm. And we've talked about this. And you could call it progressive calisthenics, right? Mm. Yeah. But that kind of, one, that sounds kind of boring. Mm. Two, when a lot of people think calisthenics, they think touch your toes, reach yeah, the ceiling, yeah, 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 twist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, we're not making, this is not something new. Like CrossFit yeah. was its own thing. It got yeah. its own name. Yeah. This is a combination of things that have already been around. Mm. Yeah. So you have to pick a name. And which is the strongest? It's gymnastics. Mm. Sure. So, mm. you know, you, even though it does sound scary to some people, it also attracts the right people. Yeah. Mm. Because when people say, oh, gymnastics, I want to be able to do that. Yeah. Mm. You know, I, I talked to someone the other day about an iron cross and they're like, how soon do you think I can do that? And they don't actually primarily train <laughs> this. They just train mobility with me. Yeah. But I was realistic with them. I was like, if you put all your time and effort into it, maybe four years, yeah. maybe. And he's, he's, you know, trains all the time, relatively strong guy, good, good mobility. So he's not coming from nowhere. Mm. But still, like maybe, yeah. mm. you know? So but to get to that level, that's, I don't know, you, you get these people that want to achieve a high level of success mentally, but then when you put them through the physical, they don't always, they don't always follow through with that. Mm. Sometimes the goals change. Mm, very interesting. Yeah. Is there anything else uh, before we finish that you'd like to add in, in terms of where the industry is going, where you think the industry should go, or any maybe advice that you might like to share with our audience? Yeah, I think people should try to try things out of their comfort zone. Something sounds right for you and it seems like someone's doing something good just because you're uncomfortable is not an excuse not to show up. Mm -hmm. If you stay comfortable, you're never going to change. Love it. Yeah. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. Right? That's what Joe DeSena I, says. I love that. I agree. I agree. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that because, you know, if, you, if you're doing the same thing time and time and time again and you're getting the same result, you, you need to uh, look uh, to a different source and most likely that's going to give you a, um, a better, better answer. Mm. So. I'm definitely very excited that I've found you guys. All right. <laughs> and look, before I let you go, I've got to ask you a personal question. Sure. Um, now, we ask all our guests this question on the show. Mm. Do you have a tattoo? I don't. You don't? I don't, no. Uh, have you ever thought about it, Paul? Yeah, I, 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 I actually like tattoos a lot. Um, and I, I like them. I just like the, I just like the, just the, the physical you know, artistry of them, you know, um, just for whatever reason, I just have never gotten it. But I, 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 when I see tattoos on people, I just, I think they're great. Interesting, because yeah. I actually made this into a YouTube video, not okay. only to see how you perform and how you train others, but yeah. I was hoping you were going to drop your pants and show us <laughs> your bottom yeah. cheek. <laughs> but uh, we missed out. <laughs> Nick? I do. Oh. Yeah. So this is actually a really good story. Yeah. Well, I think. So uh, I have a son on my right shoulder. And it's super cliche. So many people have it. So my fiance's uncle has the exact same tattoo as me. Um, it looks very similar to Nick Lachey from 98 Degrees. <laughs> now, with that being said, I completely designed it myself. And the reason I chose it was because I have a ton of great memories. Oh, I am a warm weather person. I love the sun. If, if when I think of good memories, they usually revolve around being in the sun. So. I always wanted that. Now, granted, I actually wanted a lot more to go with that to make it not such a focal point, but there's been so many great things that have come out in health and wellness industry and lab tests I wanted to do. I just, or courses I want to take, I can't mentally put money into getting more tattoos rather than improving myself. Wow, that's an so, awesome yeah. story. And just to finish off, you're going to have to show us it now. Can you, can you pull up your <laughs> yeah. It's not on your bottom, so don't uh, be so shy. Guns, the a, guns are out. Yeah. Up here. A little oh, faded wow. now. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. I did Good. draw this myself, though. And my tattoo artist, the reason I chose him was because he had a charcoal drawing of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right, on and, his and, thing. and then obviously he met your, uncle, uh, your fiance's uncle and, <laughs> and sold it. I know, seven, nine years later. Awesome. Look, thank you guys so much for thank coming. Thank you, Ali. It was awesome. Yeah, thank Great. you. It was thank fun. You.